Welcome back. This is Professor Waits, and we are in Chapter 15. We're going to jump in and start talking a little bit about class hierarchies. So let's go ahead and just get started. Um, we talked a little bit about this already in some of the previous videos, but as I was saying is when it comes to extending from other classes, you can have a base class like Class A here, and then you can have a derived class, which is extending from Class A. And then Class C can then make use of that derived class and also extend from it. So Class C here is derived from Class B that is derived from Class A. So you got to start asking yourself when that happens, well, what does Class C actually see? Does it see all of Class B and Class A? Again, it really comes down to those uh, protector levels. So anything in Class A that's public is going to be seen by Class B and then also Class C. So that's how that works. So when it comes to inheritance uh, and these class hierarchies, the things that you've been taught before, um, it still applies. And just kind of keep in mind is if class B is able to see it from class A and it's, actually to take that back, let's let's back up a little bit and try to do it this way. We're going to let's erase all this nonsense. Whoop. Pin wants to work today or not? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so imagine as you're inheriting, if this item is public up here, and we are inheriting by a public, then it's going to be seen as if it's part of this class as a public item as well. So when class C goes to inherit from this, it will see this as a public item as well. And that will then translate down to here. If we were to use, let's say, a private moderate, uh, mod modification, private accessor actually, you make that uh, we're, we're extending from class B to class A as a private, then even though this is public, this is now, remember, that means we've changed this now in class B to private. So now class C would not see it. Kind of keep that in mind as we're doing class hierarchies. So here's a good example of class hierarchy. We've got um, you know this graded activity, which makes sense, right? This is kind of a generic, more of a generic type where a final exam is of graded activity. And then this pass fail activity is of graded activity as well. Now what we've done is we've also said that this pass fail exam is of type is of class fail activity. So again, maybe at some point we're going to do some other kind of, um, maybe we say, a, B, C, pass, you know, D, F, fail, and a class, however you want to do it. Um, so again, just an example of a hierarchy. Now I will tell you, when it came to polymorphism and virtual member functions, and a lot of these object-oriented pieces, when I was uh, going through and learning C++, oftentimes, I understood the concept, but I couldn't understand why the concept, what was going on, and why would we ever use it. And it's one of those things that as you get in there, just make reasons to use it for now. And sometimes it'll be successful and it'll make sense. And sometimes it won't. But through that, by playing with it, you'll actually all of a sudden, and it's like a light bulb, all of a sudden you'll just go bling, and you're going to be like, oh, okay. I get now. I'm gonna try to draw a light bulb because I want to all of a sudden. Here we go. Now I know for all of you that are really young, this is an old light bulb that has the little filament running through. It's not an LED. Sorry about that. What can I tell you? Moving on. And no, I'm not a boomer. All right. So polymorphism and virtual member functions. You've kind of done something similar to this, but it's not truly a private, uh, excuse me, a virtual member function yet. Um, it's because you've 
you may have a base class that you set up um, functions and then in subclasses you um, redefine those functions, right? This is kind of similar except in this we're saying we're not going to um, define it up here. You have to define it here. So that's why it's a function in a base class that expects, and there's the keyword, expects to be redefined in the derived class. So kind of remember that is you're not going to now define this. You're not going to give a function up here. You're just going to um, make use of saying, hey, if you want to extend from me, you have to declare this. You're going to have to redefine it. And what's nice about that is it creates this thing called dynamic binding. Now here is again where one of those places that it's just going to be confusing at first. Bear with me. And what happens is there's two types of binding. And I don't want to get in this slide. I'm not going to get too much into it because we're going to talk about it in our slide. But there is static binding, and then there is dynamic binding. Come on. So when you do uh, virtual. Um, here, uh, uh, virtual member functions, they will support dynamic binding. Oh, it says that. Let's see. Without virtual member functions, it uses the static binding, which is compile time. So in this example, it's saying that graded activity, remember, if we think back, we had classes. We had um, graded activity was the base class and then we had extending from that was like the pass fail exam or something like that we had these different things ex expanding so here in this function in the parameter for this function we're not using these derived classes we're instead using the base class and what that means is when we go to if we make a type of this class right so Let's call this now kind of just A class, B class, and C class. If I make a type, make a um, if I make an object of type this B class, this pass fail exam class, and I pass it into this param, it's smart enough to know that because this is is of type graded activity, we can do that. But because of that, we're going to um, uh, be using dynamic. Um, binding. And the reason being is dynamic binding happens during runtime. That means when the compiler puts all of this code together and bundles it up, it's not going to know necessarily what's going to come in, what true item is going to come into this function, where if we go and look at some other function, let's see if we can find one here. Nope. We've seen functions like this um, where we didn't use like a base type. Um, if we, because of this, the compiler says, well, just because they can pass this graded activity in, we also know that these other items extend from that. So they technically could also be passed in as a type of this. And so because of that, we can't go ahead and compile statically as if we know what's going on. We have to compile knowing that this is going to be dynamic, and we have to wait until it actually gets used during the program's runtime to know how to handle this. So that's the difference between static. Static says we will know, like, if um, if all of this was simply, like, hold on a second here. If this was a constant int activity, well, this could compile statically because the compiler already says it has to be an int. There's no way to get around that. It has to be an int. And that's why this has to be. Sometimes these pens, I swear, it's the bane of drawing. As you can tell, though, I like to draw a lot. So um, because of this, we don't know exactly what type could be coming in, and that's why it has to use the dynamic. So here, um, they're showing an example of setting up a 
past activity test, which we know is a type of graded activity. So we know that. Um, and that means that it's going to use, when we pass it into this, it's going to use the set score that is supposed to be part of that pass fail activity. But we can see that it didn't. The grade letter grade member function returns C instead of P, because 72 is a pass. So why did that happen? I know you're going, Professor Waits, that's, you just told us that's not how it happens. So what's going on? It's the graded activity class get letter function was executed instead of the pass fail activity class's version of the function. Because, I go up. I thought they had the class here. Anyways, so the um, the get letter was called from the um, the grade activities version version and not the pass fail, and that's because we didn't tell the grade activity version that the pass fail activity version existed because we didn't make it a virtual. So, again. Let's rewind that a little bit, and we're saying that the grade activity has a function of the get letter. Let me scroll up. I gotta find where they define this because okay, I paused it and I looked through, and I cannot find where in this um, presentation that they actually um, show what's inside of each class. But what I'm saying that you know to to bring everyone up to speed, this get letter grade is in both grade activity and pass fail, but because um, we didn't make it a virtual, the problem we have is that because we have said that the item coming in is a grade activity, it's going to use that, if it's not a virtual, it's going to use that type rather than pass fail. If we had made uh, this a virtual, it would automatically know to do it as a dynamic and it would have used the pass fails version of get letter grade. So that's how that works. And here we're even talking about it. So in program 1510, the C is displayed instead of P because the get letter grade is statically bound, so we didn't do a virtual, with the grade activity class. And we can remedy this by making the function virtual. So I'm glad I said all that just so we can go to another slide and for them to summarize that. So that's, that is the summary of all this. Virtual functions. A virtual function is that dynamically bound and calls that we uh, uh, does not statically um, at runtime, excuse me, statically at compile time, uh, figure it out instead it does it at runtime. At runtime, C++ determines the type of object making the call rather than statically um, when it's compiling. And we just showed that, how to make a function virtual. Word. Oh, my pen. My pen. My pen. Virtual. And here, they're even showing it. They've now made that virtual. We re recompile our program with the updated version of the class you're gonna see now it's gonna call the right one. So this type of behavior is known as polymorphism. And it means the ability to take many forms. Polymorphism is one of the pillars of object-oriented programming. You need to get to understand polymorphism and all of its uh, complexities. Um, that is one of the key components. And more than likely when you go start interviewing for uh, program uh, jobs, they're gonna ask you about polymorphism. Um, it's one, neat and fun to say, um, but two, people look really smart when they say it, and three, if you don't have the answer, you're probably not the right candidate. So, 1512 demonstrates polymorphism by passing objects of graded activity and pass-fail using the um, virtuals. So here's that class. I'll let you take a look at it, um, and it goes through everything that we just talked about.
So that polymorphic behavior is only possible, by the way, when um, you are using uh, references and pointers. Uh, so make sure that you're doing that. So let's see if we can get another example of that. This is where we're dynamically allocating memory by using the new keyword. And now, because we're using pointers, it's going to be polymorphism. So what about base class pointers? Base class pointers and references only know about the members of the base class. So you can't use a base class pointer to call a derived class function, because again, you can't go from base class down to a derived. That's a no-no. And redefined functions and delivered uh, derived classes will be ignored unless you use the virtual. I know, C++ is all about the rules. Redefining versus overriding. And in C++, your redefined functions are statically bounded, while the overridden functions are dynamically bound. So a virtual function is overridden, and a non-virtual function is redefined. Please understand this. Might be on a test. Might be on a test. Virtual function is overridden. Non-virtual is redefined. And because we are C++, we like to make sure that we complicate it as much as possible. It's a good idea to make unique uh, structures virtual if the class could ever become a base class. Otherwise, the compiler will perform the static binding on the destructor The class is ever, if that class is ever derived from. So kind of look at your program 15.4 for an example. Now, when we hit C++11, the override and final keywords. In this, we've got the override keyword, which tells the compiler that the function is supposed to override a function in the base class. And then we've got the member of a function is declared when the final keyword, and it cannot be overridden in the derived class. So take a look at programs 15.7 and 15.8 for an example. You'll make use of override and final quite a bit. All right. So in the next video, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about abstract base classes and pure virtual functions. Now, we've talked about virtual functions, but what are pure virtual functions? All right. I will see you soon in the next video.